Chameleon Air is a rapper, investor, and entrepreneur who has sold millions of records and also won a Grammy and an MTV Music Video Award. He went from growing up in a notoriously dangerous neighborhood of Houston and wanting to rap, which his parents were highly opposed to, to selling his mixtapes on the street and becoming a best-selling artist worth millions. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, top I got a top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. All my life. It's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle but you know you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Chameleon Air and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy! Okay let's kick it off with rule number one, learn to communicate. Early I used to be the guy that would always be in everybody's ear telling them everything I thought they should do but I realized that you, you kind of got to hide the medicine inside of Kennedy, you know, because people will um, often like, uh, you know, rebel from that. They, they don't, they don't want to be around that. It's like oil and water. You know, it feels like you're, you're um, looking at them and judging them and, you know, you, you think you're better than them, all these different things. So even though it was rooted in wanting to see people actually succeed, it actually came off wrong to people. But it was just in my nature. I guess it was from my parents. They used to do it, you know, and I felt like I was uh, helping people. But then... Over time, I started to learn the better approach, the, the way to like lead people to the water but not force them to drink it, you know, and I felt like that was way more effective. But when you start to grow and you start to, you know, see things, sometimes, you know, you lose people. I have friends that never left the north side of Houston. Like, they've never seen the other side of the city. And, you know, somebody could laugh at that. To me, that's like, man, you, you, don't, you don't have ambition to want to see that side. Mm -hmm. Some of them are like, nah. I'm stuck in my ways and they feel like they're doing it for real reasons. They're keeping it real and staying so loyal to this thing that raised them. But it's like, you can still be loyal to your side of town by knowing what the other side is about. Matter of fact, you might know how to help your side even better by understanding what's happening on the other side, mm. you know? But saying this to somebody uh, sometimes can come off wrong. You have to find out how to communicate. So I've always had that struggle with how to communicate things that I think are valuable to people and over time, I feel like rapping kind of taught me that, you know, it, it taught me how to articulate my thoughts because you're seeing a lot of things and you're going to music to explain it to an audience of people. And you have so many different types of people that you're talking to. Mm -hmm. You know, you got some people that come from the background that you come from. You got some people that have no idea what you're talking about and everything's foreign to them. But how do you articulate these things to people and get everybody to care about it? I think people can focus on your passion. They can tell when you're authentic. All these things you start to hone in on and get really, really good at. And then people will start to listen. Rule number two, be curious. I was in the music industry having success as an artist, you know, doing all the stuff that rappers do, going on tour and, you know, hanging on jets with Diddy and stuff like that. And then um, I started seeing a lot of businesses that were cannibalizing the music industry. So that gave that made me curious. And I, I wanted to learn more about why these companies were able to do something that I felt was damaging our industry. So that curiosity made me study a lot of companies. And then I learned about this thing called Silicon Valley and all of these tech companies. Now at first, for a rapper, that's kind of intimidating. It's a lot of smart tech engineers and, oh man, I don't know nothing about that type of stuff. It just seemed boring. But then when I you know, upon further investigation, I started realizing that, wait a second, there's something special happening here. All the tools that we use from Instagram to Twitter to Snapchat, these tools are built by young people, right? That understand social. And I was like, wait a second, I understand social. So I started going to tech conference after tech conference, and I was just curious. I was listening. I was hearing what everybody was saying and meeting all kinds of different people, learning about all the different layers, venture capitalists, founders, engineers, et cetera, et cetera. And then once I got enough information, then I started realizing, wait a second, I think this is right for me. Rule number three, diversify. My business partner in the silos back there, he, a lot of y'all have seen him walking around with me at this conference. And he grew up with Big Boy from Outcast, who also is here. You've seen him walking around. It's telling in itself that Big Boy from Outkast, one of the largest, most legendary selling group of all time is at a VC conference. Just think about that, you know? Yep. That, that, that tells you how, and he's not hurting. He can buy everybody in here a Phantom Rolls Royce, you know? <laughs> so, so, but that tells you the direction that everybody is looking when it comes to tech because, you know, you have to find a way to diversify because for me, 
a song wasn't enough because they treat, treat an artist to be like, you know, to go chase cash, go do a show here and just get cash, and I'm in the business of equity. So I'm actually an artist that learned how to administrate my own album, uh, my publishing, universal publishing, they'll talk directly to me, there's no manager, no middleman, so I had to learn a lot and started knowing how to do a deal with Spotify, or knowing how to do a deal with uh, Volkswagen Global for my song and a commercial, or you know, Coca-Cola reached out and wanted to do a deal, a licensing deal, so I learned all these aspects of how to, you know, uh, to do business. Rule number four, take risk. I've watched the music industry change from when I used to do mixtapes. We used to physically go and press up a CD, and I used to put my money in, go press them up, my music, and drive across the country, or across the city, across the town, to sell my CDs to a mixtape store. So I had to physically do it. I came from the ground. I did, there was nobody doing it for me. I was a young kid. I would make some money, and I would invest $20,000 of my own money, and press, and, and gamble it all. It might have been all I had, and press up my CDs, and then I would go sell it back to stores and make my money back. So I learned how to get rid of my product. Also, if you want to have more confidence, check out my 254 series where every day for the next 254 days, I'll send you an amazing unlisted video via email for free to help you build your confidence. The links to join are in the description below. I'm making music because I love it. And it's why I'm here. You know, and the one thing you have to really never do is compare yourself to other people. Absolutely. That's the one thing you can't do is judge Absolutely. your success to someone else's. It doesn't matter what's happening. I don't care what's happening. I don't care what you're on or this person's on. This is what I like. You, you know, never gotta watch. My, my, my life is telling me for me. Rule number five, help others. I used to uh, go to this church on the north side and there was a, a guy one time that um, was a pastor and he used to have braids. And he used to come in and he used to talk to us just like he was one of us. And everybody used to listen to him. And the other guys would come and they'd have the button ups and nobody listened to them. And I saw that over and over and I was just like, He's a pastor just like he's a pastor, but everybody listens to him because he, he felt like he was just one of us. He used to play basketball with us. He used to do all these things. And I always had these things wrestling in my head because, you know, you almost feel like you're not, you don't belong a lot of times in all these different places. You know, as an African-American kid in the city, you know, you're, you're in certain areas and people are looking at you like you don't belong. You go to church and they're looking at you like, what are you doing here? Because you show up with a hoodie. I remember one time they were uh, having an open gym and I wanted to help all these kids in the city come in a, uh, you know, um, have a place to play basketball. So I spent a lot of time putting up the basketball goals, doing a lot of stuff. And then I went home to get, you know, to washed up so I could come back and play basketball. And then I come back and they wouldn't let me in. And they're like, excuse me, sir, this is only for the members of the church. And I'm like, I just spent the whole day putting up the, and I was, I was so mad. I was like arguing with this guy that wouldn't stop me. And then that guy with the braids came in and was like, no, no. And let, let you know, and it's just that little understanding of, of welcoming, you know what I'm saying, that mm. I kind of saw sometimes, and when I would see an example of that, I would try to be that, and try to be like, you know what, I'm gonna be more of like, not trying to judge people, and trying to help them be uh, the best that they can be. And it started transitioning to music, and then it transitioned to entrepreneurship, and then it just, it just became something that now is just like my day, daily life. Rule number six, focus on information and relationships. When people look at me and they see me as a musician, we all, all, people often bring up money. How much money you've made in your career or how much money you're chasing. And even my name has money in it. Millionaire, I get it, right? But my, my focus has never been actually about money. It's always been about information and relationships. I've always understood that those two things were going to be the things that were going to make me successful. So I think if every, everybody can get that in their DNA and understand that information and relationships is very important and will give you money, you understand the value of that, you always treat every situation like an opportunity to gain a connection or gain more insight. And that will give you confidence, right? When I started, I didn't know nothing about tech. Remember, not that long ago, I was wearing gold teeth. I had to do rag, like I'm way more advanced than I was then, you know? And maybe four years, five years from now, I'll be way more advanced than I am now, but it's because I'm just consuming information like crazy, right? So I think anybody can do it, you just have to want to do it. And then that information will lead you everywhere you need to go. Like, I didn't know what tech conferences to go to. At first, I, I, I had some tech conferences I went to, I was like, oh, what am I doing here, right? But then I learned the ecosystem. I realized which ones made more sense and which ones made were right for me and which people would connect well with me. And then I started getting there and I started getting to the right places. I started meeting the right people. And then it just, one thing led to another. Rule number seven, follow your passion. Well, first, when I got involved in music, I never did it because I wanted to make money. I never did it because I wanted to have a platinum record. Um, you know, I won a Grammy. I never did it to win a Grammy. Like my Grammy is in a, 
a box under my fish tank. I never pulled it out, all right? Because it was about passion for music. Rule number eight, be perceptive. You're definitely not somebody who has followed a typical path really at any point in your life. And what do you attribute that to? How did you not succumb to just what everybody was telling you to do? Man, that's a good question. Um, I think it was really just um, watching and observing. I feel like I was a very perceptive person and I used to see people in my early years have success and people fail. Some people took a route where they started selling drugs mm. and then I see the result of that. And you know, I was one of the people that was trying to avoid those pitfalls. Like even earlier when I started doing music, I saw so many people that got uh, bad deals or talked about the music industry like they wouldn't make money. So me watching that so much, I, I was trying to reverse engineer what I saw. And I would sit back and I was like kind of quiet. You know, I, I feel like I'm a introvert that knows how to act like an extrovert, you know? But um, I was super quiet and I used to just watch and I feel like observing helped me a lot. Rule number nine, have confidence. One thing that Sky mentioned in the last panel about building relationships with people before you need something from them. So really thinking about how do you um, reach out to a VC? You may not be raising funding now. You may be thinking about it, but starting to build those relationships early. So Cam had that kind of relationship. He mentioned Mark Schuster, which is he's one of the biggest venture capitalists in Los Angeles. Tell us a little bit about how you cultivated that relationship and how it grew over time. Um, I think... I had a level of confidence that most people don't have. And what I mean by that is, um, I try to make people relearn everything that they think that they know about people like me, right? Traditionally, a rapper is just this thing, like, oh, he's just a rapper, it's a bad thing, right? But I started getting frustrated with people throwing that stuff at me, and I would change it and say, you know what? Being a rapper means having your finger on the pulse of the millennial generation, right? To be hot, like Jay-Z for such a long period of time, you have to know what the young generation thinks. You have to know what they dancing in the club, what kind of sounds they like, what kind of shoes they wearing, what new car, and you have to be ahead of the curve. And you can use that as an advantage. So when they throw this rapper thing at me, I switch it around and say, nah, that's what it is, right? And then a lot of the people that are out here get putting capital in all these companies and investing in all these companies, they don't even use the products. Like a lot of y'all could probably tell me about Snap more than they could. So once I started to realize that, it just became a confidence that I started having. And I would talk to them like, no, actually, it doesn't work like that. It works like this. And then they would be like, what? And then I would prove them wrong. And the next thing you know, they're listening to me for insight. So it didn't necessarily happen like that with Mark Suster. Mark Suster was a person that just recognized that. And he was like, you know what? I like your confidence. I like your understanding of social. Let's just build a relationship. And it started from there. So he offered to invest in me like five, six years ago, and I, I, would, I just wouldn't take his money. I was like, nah, I got my own money. Next thing you know, I started giving him my insight on all kind of companies, and I think he understood the diverse opinion coming into the room and how valuable that was, and that's why me and him built a bond like that. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip, is never give up. My dad didn't like rap, period. Like, he didn't care about nothing rap. Like, he's a stern, strong African, like militant type of person, right. you know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, I used to write raps real sloppy on purpose because my dad would come and see those raps and he'd just throw them away. Like, what is this, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, he didn't care. So, um, but I had a passion for it. You know, kids always gonna be rebellious and start doing things that you tell them not to do. Right. But I realized that I had a gift for words, really. You know, at a young age, I can make words rhyme just off the top of my head with no paper. So everybody couldn't do that. And at the school table, everybody used to beat on the table and they used to come up with freestyles. But I, I would watch other people do it and I wouldn't really jump in, but I knew that I was good at it. Yeah. Because I would go home and practice it all the time. I was like, man, I'm actually better than them. So eventually when I started doing it, then people started knowing me as a person that just always rapped all the time. They used to be like, shut up. Right, yeah. You're not going to make it. Like everywhere, everybody used to say that. Like people next to me in, in you know, every class, there's probably people to this day that went to school with me. It was like, man, I cannot believe that dude made it. Now I've got a really special bonus clip that I think you're going to enjoy. But before that, if you're still here watching and you promise, you commit that you're going to take action after watching this video, you're not just going to watch a video, you're going to do something afterwards. Give me a hashtag, but leave in the comments because I want to celebrate you. If you're a millennial and you're coming up and you're trying to um, get involved in the music industry, it's promising. The future is bright, right? It, it can get to a place where eventually you'll be making money. And I think it's more about like standing out from the rest of the people. If there was somebody walking around here that had purple hair and everybody went home and they said, hey, do you remember the guy with the blazer? Everybody's gonna be like, ah, there's a hundred guys with blazers. But if you say the guy <laughs> with the purple hair, everybody's gonna be like, yeah, I remember that guy, you know? So I think it's more about standing out as an artist, but 
that alone nowadays isn't enough to give you the capital to be able to just exist. You, a lot of these artists have to have another job and that, you know, that, that, that's why their focus a lot of times doesn't completely um, stay with the music sometimes. Sometimes they give up and an artist that could have been the next Lord or the next whatever ends up giving up because they couldn't sustain a, living, a proper living, you know? Was that, was that your motivation or was it more about, you got passionate about, more passionate about something else? I had to make it, I had to make it. I was living in a one room condominium with my mother, right? And my mother's eating cereal for dinner. And I'm looking at her like, man, I'm working all these jobs. You know, my dad's not around. Uh, the next door neighbor gets shot and killed. And I'm sitting there thinking like, man, I gotta find a way, you know, I gotta make it. So I'm, I'm going, doing multiple jobs, not making that much money to sustain my family. And I was, you know, luckily rap took off for me, but once it started even a slight trajectory upwards, then I was like, okay, I'm gonna go all the way in. So I think a lot of artists need the pain, you know, because the pain sometimes pushes you, even if you're a startup founder and you're having issues with raising money or even, I mean, it's kind of hard for me to feel sorry for VCs and LPs because they are messed with so much money. It's like, <laughs> boo-hoo, yeah, you, you know. You couldn't raise another 250 million, you know? But, um, you know, for the artists that can't, like, eat food tomorrow, that, I think, is valuable, and I think they need that. If you want to see the top 10 I did on Jay-Z, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. My advice is to do things that are true to you. I wish I could say we were geniuses and say <laughs> we're going to start our own company. You know, I, I, that's not what happened.